When everyone you serve wants a pina colada, how do you keep up with global cocktail trends? Our guest story proves where there's a will, there's a way. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by everyone in this industry. Daniel Jones, Global Brand Ambassador for the House of Angostura, crisscrosses the world teaching all and sundry about Angostura bitters, the most globally distributed cocktail ingredient in the world, and historically, one of only three ingredients that makes up the classic cocktail. During our chat, not only does he take us on his journey, but also he reveals how to win a cocktail competition. He also explains how Chicago embraces Angostura bitters like no other city in the world. Before all that, I just wanted to remind you that most bars are open now, at least in the UK, so please support them. Some still have delivery, so make sure to find out their status before heading out. Stay safe and always drink responsibly. Now, here's Daniel. I am so excited to have you on the show today. So thank you for being here. Uh, We always start the same way because Mm -hmm. I love it. I'd love to hear about where Mm -hmm. you grew up, your upbringing, and kind of what started you on this path. Awesome. You know, um, I have to say for me, hospitality really started as a, you know, it was bridged from a dream that I had as a young young man. Um, I grew up in humble beginnings in the countryside on an island called Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, for those who know the Caribbean, they would know about Trinidad because we have one of the number one carnivals in the world. Uh, it's it's very intense. It's um, it's it's different from uh, its rival. It rivals that of Rio de Janeiro's carnival uh, because it's a small country, just one point three million. But we have our own genre of music. We have such a, a huge diaspora of different cultures. Uh, you know, I am heavily African descent, but my mother is, my grandmother is from India. My great grand is from India. So I have a mix of Indian, African. So you, the Caribbean has that diaspora that's just so incredible. And what that does, it filters into the cuisine. It filters into the lifestyle. And, you know, and this is where the beauty of the Caribbean really blossoms. Um, so we don't have authentic Indian cuisine. We don't have authentic African. We don't have authentic uh, Chinese. You know, it's 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 the, everything is just mixed with that Caribbean vibe and flavor. So for me, growing up, um, I grew up in a countryside, um, and this gave me a lot more of the the the, the raw Caribbean uh, upbringing. Um, so I, I know what it is to to go in the the sugarcane fields uh you know we did not have playstations during that that time and you'd just be hanging out in the cane fields you'd be hanging out uh, on the mango trees picking you know today i mean i i'm in paris right now and when i see the mangoes i'm like man like i i always remember sitting on a mango tree <laughs> and just picking a mango from the mango tree and just eating it right there organic and you know and it's it's like I miss that feeling because this is something, this is a luxury that you have to pay for now. So at home, um, what were, what was being cooked? Did you have all those flavors? Was it, you know, a melding of one thing, those mangoes? Uh, you, know? you know, my mom, so I grew up, you know, as a, my mom was a single parent for some time, three boys and one girl, the girl being the last, I'm being, I'm the eldest. And she always told us as young men, she taught us all how to cook. She said, never accept food from an angry woman. So we were always taught <laughs> to cook our own food just in case. Um, so she grew us up, you know, to be gentlemen and also to ensure that we can cook our own food. So growing up, we were not privy to processed foods and stuff like that. I always remember uh, my introduction. Now I'm the global brand ambassador for the House of Angostura. And I always remember as a kid when we had lunch, uh, you know, my mom would say, go make some juice. And we would, you know, we would not buy juice from the supermarket because everything is homemade. You run into the back of the yard, you look for whatever fresh citrus is available, lime, oranges, or grapefruit. You pick it, squeeze it, add sugar, water, and a few dashes of Angostura bitters. And, you know, and it's it's one of those charming reminders that I have every time I represent the House of Angostura. Uh, you were born to be <laughs> this role, right? <laughs> yeah, it has such a nice connection. <laughs> so I think just to answer the first question, um, you know, my journey into hospitality started uh, with a dream of one day having a fine dining restaurant. Uh, you know, we would not, I did not have the, 
the resources uh, to go to, uh, you know, to dine at restaurants while, while growing up. Um, so it was something that was very ostentatious for me. In my mind, I was like, you know, I would sit on television and I'm like, you know, one day I want to have my own restaurant. But uh, there were three options. The first being uh, you have to be an A-class chef, which I was not. The second being having investors that will that would uh, you know invest in that concept, and the third being creative. And uh, so I opted for the third option, and um, so I went and I started pursuing my degree in uh, restaurant management. Um, I started working part time at TGI Fridays, and uh, I always remember I was I was so excited just to go in TGI Fridays. And this is not a plug for TGI Fridays, but I would always you know just be so excited because this is part of my journey. I would go to work early and my only position was a waiter and I would go there and I would start my job early, but I would always go early so that I could help the bartenders set up their stations. And my aim was within one year to learn as much as I could because one day I would become a manager and then eventually I would have my own restaurant. And that was my path. You know, that was my, my map <laughs> right there. And I'm like, okay, let me follow this. So while I'm pursuing my degree, I'm working, I'm going to become a restaurant manager, and then hopefully I will be able to have my own restaurant in the future. Now, this idea of fine dining, mm. what did that actually mean mm. to you? Had you seen, uh, you know, one specific restaurant that you were shooting for, like an El mm. Boudi or a French Laundry? <laughs> Ratatouille. You know, have you seen that program? <laughs> right. Or, right, or Ratatouille? What what did fine fine restaurant mean to you that you that you wanted to mm. pursue? At that? that time, you know, I'll be honest with you. At that time, I was not traveling the world and going to Michelin star restaurants and stuff like that. At that time, it was just a restaurant that was um, that had high end uh, clientele, that had artisanal food, a great wine list, uh, you know. That you know. So I think because I was, I did not have that experience and exposure to restaurants. It was uh, it was a dream of having a restaurant that had a great wine list um, and just artisanal food or gourmet food at that time, and. Uh, you know, I have to say, what, what, do you remember what gourmet food meant to you? Yeah. Like, was a three it course meal? Trinidadian, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, but Trinidadian, uh, French. <laughs> you know, or were you thinking, like, what kind of cuisine? Or you didn't have that in yeah, your mind. In terms yet. of the cuisine, no, none of that was really uh, in depth as yet. I think I was just thinking in terms of a, uh, you know, a three to five course menu, um, you know, something like that. Um, you know, a, a, a la carte style, you know, I, it was it was not in terms of the cuisine because I'm not a chef. I was thinking more in terms of the, mm -hmm. the image of it, you know, and I was thinking more of the clientele and and just that that grand dream of, you know, high end clientele drinking great wine and eating great food. And that was, you know, because it was so far fetched for a moment, I felt like, OK, I will work my way up. But I had a vision of how I wanted to look, valet parking, stuff like that. So it was more about the concept and the image. And, and and you being out there being, you know, hospitable, mm. should I say that word, but inviting people in to share that experience. Yeah. So I, I think, I think yeah. you know, when I started working at TJ Fridays, I'll be honest with you, it was my first time. I grew up as the eldest of four kids, a so single parent. So I was uh, at a young age, uh, six years old, I'm cooking already. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a man because I'm looking, I have to set the example for my siblings. So I'll be honest with you, um, I was not, uh, I was not a drinker. I was not exposed to, uh, you know, we were not, I was not drinking alcohol. So when I went into TJ Fridays, it was my first time being exposed. I mean, I went to school and, and I was just so focused on making sure I, I, you know, I stayed focused in school, but at TJ Fridays, I'm like, I went into the bar and I'm seeing strawberry liqueur or chocolate liqueur. And I'm like, there, there are spirits or liquid equivalent to food. And it was my first time being exposed to this world of of wines and spirits um and while at tj fridays i built a reputation uh, uh within the hospitality community as a great bartender and i was um given the position as a head bartender for a gourmet restaurant uh where three of the top chefs on the island came together to create a restaurant that was supposed to be the elite restaurant on the on the island so it gave me an opportunity to move into fine dining and classic cocktails and this is where I got more into, you know, that whole realm of classic cocktails. So that was my journey as a bartender. Um, and the dream of having a restaurant, I always feel like I want to be, I feel like if I'm not open to change, then I'm not going to evolve uh, like a butterfly. 
You know, I feel like you have to accept mm-hmm. change in, a, in its beauty. So my dream has evolved. And um, so it moved from while I was at the fine dining restaurant, I decided to start my own business. Um, I did a mobile bar catering company for seven years, which was very successful. Um, and um, this is just, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to share this part here to anyone who's interested in getting into a field of hospitality. I always remember my my first week in TJ Fridays, and I I went to a very prestigious school, uh, so I'm, I'm I'm educated, and yet I'm I'm a waiter. I'm like I'm like friends are coming off on their 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 college breaks, and yeah, I'm I'm the one serving them, and I had to remind myself that this is hospitality, and uh, it is in that moment that one of the 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 mantras in my life uh, it's it's a, it's biblical it says uh, the greatest of leaders are the greatest of servants and uh, and in that moment I, I said you know let me stay focused on my dream and this is part of it and hospitality embodies that and this is why for me uh, hospitality is something that i truly love and i've grown to just you know it, it's a part of my lifestyle i, I breed it it's what we do i feel like there are many strong industries out there, but hospitality is one that really connects to humanity. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, being behind the bar, I've, I've interviewed a lot of people who started as chefs and they were in the back, uh, in the kitchens. And what they missed was being in, in front, talking yeah. to people and yeah. that, that yeah. part of it. And it wasn't just about making the food. And I was wondering if that happened to you when you got behind the bar at TGIF, which, by the way, I've heard has one of the most rigorous <laughs> bar programs or did, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. you know yes. in the world yeah. ever. Um, did you feel that shift, you know, the from the fine dining to the, the behind mm. the bar uh, in terms of hospitality and speaking yeah. to people and becoming who you were and growing up? I always remember I, I went into it very, I'm the novice, I'm the newbie there, you know, and there are people who were working there for five plus years. And, but I was always excited about the job because I had this vision, you know, ahead of me. And um, I always remember everyone was so concerned about the particular tables as a waiter. Uh, you know, don't touch my table. This is my table. But I felt like if I give great service to everyone, then it, it benefits us all. All right. So, I would. I had one friend in particular, and I would tell him when we worked the same shift. I said, "Okay, if you go in the kitchen, you see my food, you bring it out. If I see yours, you bring it out. You go to the bar." And we started doing this team effort together, and people would queue and wait for us to serve them. You know, and when the other servers started seeing that, they wanted to be a part of this. So there was this informal uh, team that was uh, created due to that that little concept, um, and that was during my probation period. Uh, so my first night on the service bar, it was crazy. I always remember it. I was like, I was just thrown into the lion's den or into a tornado. And, you know, I'm like, there's so many cocktails I have to remember. And it was an experience I'll never forget. And I, I did something that was very unorthodox. Um, at that time, you know, uh, the internet was uh, was a luxury to have. And I always remember, I would ask the bartenders to save the empty bottles for me. And I would take on a Friday and Saturday night, I would take bags full of empty glass and empty bottles of liquor back to my my room. And in my bedroom, I had a dry bar. And the reason for this is because I had the bottles and I could read the bottles and I could smell and get the aromas of the spirits. And this was my way of product knowledge, of of getting product knowledge. And I laugh at it now because it's it's obsolete, but I, I felt like it allowed me to connect and become a, a more passionate bartender. So um, I built a huge reputation in the, uh, in that community, and that's what helped me evolve. But while there, because of that reputation being built, my plan was just to spend three months there and go to the kitchen and learn more about the back of the house uh, in my aim to become a, bar ma- a manager. But um, because of the challenge in the bar, uh, because of the reputation I was building, I decided to to use it and to continue allowing it to grow. So um, that took me into the fine dining restaurant. And when I went to the fine dining restaurant, they had one of the largest wine lists in the country, uh, 256 wines on their list. So I started, you know, I started ordering wine encyclopedias, books, and I built my library. 
And it was one of those moments where do you try to sell uh, a very expensive bottle of wine or do you create a great cocktail? And I was always torn between this and I decided to not focus on, on just the sales, but also focus on the experience of the guest. So if I knew that the guests were interested in getting that experience, that wine experience, I wanted to ensure that I can give that. Uh, but also if they want to come and feel a James Bond experience, uh, you know, feel like it wasn't a Connaught, but if they want to feel like they had the Connaught, I'm not Ango, but I was trying to make sure that I could deliver uh, something on that caliber. Um, so that is where things evolved. And, um, yeah. and, and was working in the fine dining restaurant everything that you thought it was going to be? It, yeah, no, I always felt like I, when I went to the fine dining restaurant, I'm like, okay, yes, I'm on that path, you know, and I, I'm I'm getting there. Um, and then you know, you start to see certain realities, and uh, everyone in life there there's a there's a proverb that says many are the plans of a man, but you know his path is directed. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I'm like, okay, don't be afraid of change, and don't be afraid to evolve. So when certain uh, elements of reality came to me, I'm like, okay, what do I do? This is not what I expected. Uh, how do I deal with it? Um, and, you know, so I decided this is what brought, this is what took me into entrepreneurship. And I started my own business mm -hmm. uh, because I saw that the opportunity for me um, was not available, was not given to me. I, you know, I was not handed that that uh, that opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to put you in a superior position. I'm going to take you up the ranks. As much as I was qualified, as much as I was, uh, you know, I know that I was good at my job, um, I was not given that opportunity. So I decided to create it on my own. And um, I always remember, we don't have a cocktail culture in the Caribbean. You know, you, people come to the islands and they think, oh, it's going to be a tiki madness, man. Like, you're going to get tiki cocktails all over. And um, there's none of that. And so this was, you know, I always remember thinking to myself, what if I can give a guest that sex in the city feel, give them exactly what they see in the magazines on television uh, in reality. So I started looking at prototypes internationally and I built a mobile bar company um, from, you know, I would say from nothing. I remember borrowing an ice scoop and a, and a cooler from a friend and, and it grew from that uh, into having a warehouse and three trucks and a staff of 86 plus. And, you know, so, um, I'm very proud of that moment in my life. Um, and, but what that also led me into the ambassadorship that I'm in. Because when I started, I did not have investors. I started with, you know, just my own money. I couldn't even get uh, financial uh, assistance because alcohol is deemed as a demerit good. So the government right. does not support it. So I did everything from the ground. Um, and, you know, while doing that, I would have all of my bartenders compete in competitions. And the reason for that was because the corporate clients were my target. If I can get the corporate clients, I can get a bigger size uh, revenue um, uh, and I can have longevity on my business. But the corporate clients already had vendors. And I knew that if my guys were in competitions and they saw us in the newspapers and being published, it would be something that could entice them. And that's why I had all of my guys uh, and myself and we would all compete in competitions um, and so I was the national bartender uh, for two years consecutively, regional uh, title holder for best rum, vodka, most creative cocktail in 2011, 2012. Um, and then I won the Angostura Global Cocktail Competition in 2013. And that's where everything shifted. I want to hear a little bit more about martini makers. <laughs> um, was it... Was it something completely new in the islands? Did you have a different take on it? And that's why it was such a success. Tell me a little bit about Matt, mm -hmm. like kind of the origins of what you saw or what you wanted that company to become. Yeah. Um, at that time, you know, no one was putting the emphasis into creating um, because we don't have a cocktail culture. We had what are called fets. It's a French term for outdoor parties. So we have a lot of parties, but they're outdoor events. Um, and if you go to an outdoor event, you would not have cocktails because no one was doing that. Um, if ever there was a cocktail, it would come from, there was no pizzazz, there was no showmanship, there was no aesthetics to the cocktail. It would be something that would just be poured into a glass, 
and tasted something like a rum punch. And that was the most you would get. So I um, I started looking at, I had this uh, vision and I started looking at prototypes around the world and I started seeing, you know, bars, lit bars. I started seeing contemporary style bars and, and I decided to build these type of bars. Um, again, I did not have resources. I did not have finance. So everything was done one at a time. When I got revenue and I made, uh, you know, money from one particular event, I would reinvest it and I continue doing that. So... I had different styles of bars. I had a disco bar that would be lit. So I could do you know multiple events with that. I had contemporary style bars for uh, corporate events. I had uh, ice luges. I had different styles of concepts, and it was really to appeal to that crowd. But more importantly, what I realized is that hospitality is about uh, it's about hospitality, and you have to you have to understand when you're choosing when you're selecting your staff. I always remember when I started in the first month, I started taking the guys who worked with me, uh, the guys and girls who worked with me uh, from TJ Fridays and other restaurants. And they came with these bad habits. And I was like, no, no. And I just decided to to not work with any one of them ever again. And I started headhunting. And I started choosing people who knew nothing about cocktails, but they just loved to smile. I remember one guy in particular who stayed up to me. He was one of the longest employees with me, um, Akil Isaac. And I always remember I met him and he was working in a, what do you call a parlor? A parlor is like a mini mart. And, you know, and I always remember he was, uh, his English was not the, 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 the most articulate, but his, he was so hospitable and so friendly. I said, Hey, would you like to, to, have you ever done any work making cocktails? Would you be interested? And he came on board. And I remember the first time he was pouring orange juice for a guest and his hands were, were trembling. <laughs> and uh, he eventually grew into one of the bartenders who won many awards also, as did so many of them. But it did set a trend on the island. Um, I remember when I started, uh, you know, companies, large companies who had the resources started seeing it. They, they wanted me on board to, to build concepts like that for them. And um so the company, so the, the company grew. I had uh, I had a huge corporate clientele. I did uh, uh, the diplomatic center, the president, the governors. You know, I had so many high end clients, and I think this was the restaurant image that I was able to deliver in that moment. Um, mm-hmm. I did, you know, on the island. I did many of the events, the private events, corporate events for many of the the affluent uh, persons on the island. So I was very proud of that. And a lot had to do with the training because it, you, you have to train the staff to make sure that hospitality is about smiling, you know, learning how to deal with guests who are impolite and, and, and very rude to guests who are demanding. And, and when you're doing mobile service, it's different from a fixed bar. You don't just walk into a bar that's already there. You have to set up, you have to set up from the warehouse, get to the event, set up again there, and then break down, and it's it's a lot of different processes. But um, one more thing I will say is that it also taught me the role of leadership. Um, you see, you have many good bars out there, and when I see great bars, and I, I look at the team, when the team is great, not just the bartender, when the team is great, that is great leadership because um, it's a reflection of, of, your, of the leadership. And I felt like, because when I was trying to get, when I started become, when I was a brand ambassador, I now had to step away a bit and choose people to manage a team. And sometimes you have people who are good at what they do, but they don't know how to manage people. So they can manage the administrative work for you, but they don't know how to manage and motivate people. And um, I felt like a simple thing as saying thank you. My mom always said, you can never say thank you too many times. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we think it's about you know, someone not being paid or compensated properly, but by just saying thank you, you know, just saying thank you goes a long way. And it's those little things, those little tips that um, I felt were missing. And, and as I continued to grow in the ambassador role, I had to pull away from, uh, from the company. Now I, I completely agree with you about the thank you. Definitely. (laughs) Um, now, to win international competitions, one must be making obviously more than a rum punch. So I was, <laughs> I was wondering about the culture of cocktail making where you were mm-hmm. in Trinidad. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what were people drinking? And, uh, you know, 
the kind of cocktails or maybe that you saw the different types of ways people change their drinking habits over the years while you were in that, while you were, you know, in the role of, 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 of heading up martini um, makers? Yeah, I, I think um, you have to, there's a saying, you don't fish with steak, you fish with worms. So I may love a Negroni, but I can tell you, the guests that I was serving, some of the guests, they don't want that. They just want a pina colada, they want an apple martini, they don't want an old fashioned, they don't want a, mart uh, you know, Manhattan. So um, for me, whenever I was competing in competitions, it took me, uh, it took me away from uh, the norm. Um, and I got an opportunity to really advance my skill set. Um, but one of the, one of the, the, the core uh, influences was doing my personal research and keeping updated with cocktail trends and, and cocktail styles around the world, from the Japanese style of making cocktails to uh, the, the British style to the Americans and what was happening and what tools are being used and what methods of making cocktails are being used, what spirits are being integrated from uh, bitter style amaris to, you know, different types of liqueurs. And so, you know, for me, I, I always invested in that. So I had, um, I had a, a huge, uh, you know, room of equipment that was not used for martini makers. It was just used for my personal um, competitions and, um, one of the, the persons who really helped with that uh, and a great mentor was someone by the name of Rakesh Madhu. He was one of the, he's one of the lecturers at the Hospitality and Tourism Institute. And um, I always remember he was my coach for, there's a culinary team uh, that you compete, that you are part of when you're competing in the, in the regional competition. It's called Taste of the Caribbean. So you have a head chef, you have an executive chef, a pastry chef, a uh, fish meat and then you have the bartender and you compete with different islands from Barbados, Jamaica, Bahamas. It's, it's, uh, it happens every year. Uh, so he was my coach um, when I won in 2011 and 2012. And, um, you know, so he has always been a mentor in terms of, you know, allowing me to grow. And I, I always feel like whenever I get an opportunity to mentor anyone, I also want to be able to give that back. Uh, it's such a great thing to to it 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 doesn't take much you know once you're willing to to just share knowledge and to share experiences it helps it can help someone and for me it helped me um, so those were elements that allowed me to see beyond what I was serving beyond the pina colada beyond the mar the apple martini uh, because the Caribbean palate we love spicy food and we love sweet drinks uh, so it's not it's different from different palettes. The Italian palette, they like bitter. They, you know, the French palette, they like dry. You know, it's like you have different palettes and um, Caribbean palettes, they, they, they love the sweet stuff. So. <laughs> and when we go to the Caribbean, we love the sweet stuff. Yeah, too. yeah, That's you know. You, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all of a sudden, like you're like, oh, pina colada, oh my, when? Why have I not been drinking this? You know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so now tell me about the biggie. All mm -hmm. right, House of Angostura, yeah. the competition. Uh, because you are the, the first Islander, right, to ever yeah. win? Yeah. Yes, which is amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, what were, what were your thoughts about what you were going to make and how you attacked that competition that you won? Yeah. Now, that was, uh, I felt like, when I think back about it, I felt like I was like Tom Cruise on a, on a Mission Impossible <laughs> movie set because, <laughs> you know, I... I always remember when I got the opportunity, I, I had the national, you have the national level first. So you compete nationally. And I remember focusing on creating a cocktail for the judges nationally. But I'm aware of the international trends. I'm aware of dry cocktails, bitter style cocktails. And, you know, and, and um, but whenever you're competing in competitions, and I always remember looking at multiple videos and of how to win competitions, how to, you know, and I, I understood that you can have the crowd cheering for you, but the person who is putting the points on the paper, that's the person that you want to influence and entice. And those are the judges, the three or four or five people in front of you who are scoring, those are the people you need to impress. Um, so I always, in any competition, I started focusing and I would tell my guys, look at the judges. 
do some research into them. See what are their preferences, how they like to drink. It's like a guest coming to a bar. You come to the bar, first time we're meeting, and you're like, oh, you know what? You tell me the cliche statement, make me something special. I'm like, all right, you tell me what are you in the mood for? You want something tropical, something citrus, uh, you know, something spirit forward. And this is where you kind of understand the guest and you can create something to make them smile. So that's how I really attacked uh, most competitions. For the Angus Tour Global, this was a new level. This is global. These are bartenders from all over the world. And I'm the Caribbean guy. I'm the guy who makes rum punches and pina coladas. And I'm like... <laughs> so I felt a bit like the dark horse, um, and uh, but it was not a bad thing. I, I don't see it as a negative. I always feel like be your best. And my aim was just to be my best. Um, and I knew what I could do, and I wasn't afraid of, I wasn't focusing on anyone else but me being my best. So I started looking at the judges. There were five judges for, for the international. So I changed the concept of the drink for this particular set of judges, uh, which you were allowed to do. Were they from all? Were the judges from all over the world? Oh, I remember the head judge was Salvatore Calabrese. I mean, the the big oh man, my the maestro. Pressure. Yeah. <laughs> the maestro was uh, he was the head judge, and I, I always remember. So one of uh, so for him, I I, I remember looking at uh, uh, Calabrese, Calabrese, and I remember he had launched. He had recently launched his own lemon chilo. So in my cocktail, one of the things that I did, I, um, I created a homemade um, lemon chilo using a, one of the homemade citrus that we have, a Portugal, it's like tangerines. But I used an, an old method that was used in World War II, where you would suspend the lemons um, or the citrus in a cheesecloth, like about an inch above Everclear or overproofed uh, spirit. And I used an overproof rum. Angus de Rizzo from the local version. And um, you suspend it for about 30 days. And eventually, the oils start to drip into the liqueur. And it's, it's yeah, it's, it's very magical. And so I, I used that. I put that into, into one of my uh, cocktails. So I knew that would catch his eye. Because a judge looks at a paper before they see you, before you even perform. And when they look at the list and the method, they can tell a novice bartender from an advanced bartender. And uh, so uh, being the Caribbean guy, the pina colada guy, I'm like, okay, so I know this would catch his eye. And that was one. The second judge was Anne Turnman. At that time, she who was a, the previous, the former co-owner of, uh, co-founder of um, Tales of the Cocktails. I know she's a classic lady. She loves classic cocktails. So I used um, chartreuse and Benedictine, uh, green chartreuse in particular, uh, which is a bit de- deeper than the yellow um, in uh, one of the cocktails. And the third judge, international judge, was Ueno San from Japan. I don't know if you know Ueno San, the legendary Ueno San. So I'm like, my gosh. And um, at that time, vinegars were a popular trend in cocktails. So I, I, I found a, an aged sherry vinegar that was so delicious and, and had such great acid properties, but it was great to just, you know, it was such a, such a nice character. So I knew that that would catch his attention using a sherry vinegar because vinegar was trending in Asia. Um, so those were some elements there. Uh, in addition to that, I looked at two different techniques to showcase my ability. So I did a, a shaking style of cocktail and a stirred style of cocktail. But I also integrated a smoking technique, but not using the smoking gun like everyone was using. I built a homemade bamboo smoker. So I took a small bamboo stalk and I drilled some holes, stuffed it up with some nice cinnamon bark. But the cinnamon bark was soaked in Angostura and sun-dried. So I soaked it in a cup of Angostura bitters and I put it out to dry. And when it was dry, it was nice and concentrated. And um, so that was the, the, the wood that I used for the smoke. And so all of these different elements as, as what I put into the cocktail. And I also looked at my competition uh, just to see where their mindset were in terms of their cocktails and um, their, their, you know, so I was prepared. <laughs> I want to have that cocktail right now. Oh my God, it sounds so good. Yeah. So it's two cocktails you have to create. Um, uh-huh. And uh, and you have seven minutes to create the two cocktails. And uh, so, yeah, so it was, um, it was, you, 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 
Did you get feedback on them? Obviously you won. So you know mm. that you did well, but did you, did you ever talk to them about, you know, Oh, I did this because I yeah. knew you like this, or that, you know, did no, you ever I, talk to them about that? No, I, I, I didn't share that with them. I, you know, yeah. I, I took uh-huh. the, I took the comments uh, back and um, you know, what they said and stuff like that. But you know, my strategy, I, I, I think this is the first time I'm sharing this publicly with, uh, with anyone <laughs> um, other than Barton, this would ask me personally how to, how to approach a competition um but you know i think um this is the first time publicly so uh <laughs> salvatore if you're listening you know much love brother bueno san <laughs> and much love to everyone um but it was it was strategic yeah no it's a really <laughs> great lesson it's a yeah. great great lesson on any competition no mm-hmm. matter what it doesn't have to be a cocktail competition to know who's judging you well actually you know you know the person, the person who really inspired me to do that was dale DeGruff. I always remember looking at a video, um, it was a Disarano competition and someone asked him how to win a competition and he said, you have to impress the judges. And when he said that, I'm like, that is so true. I, and that's what I just shared with you, but it was Dale DeGruff, you know, uh, who really inspired me to start looking in that direction and that has been my approach. And so you get this, you get this title and you win this award mm-hmm. and then what happens? What, what is your job like then? Yeah, what do so, you do as as the global brand ambassador? Um, you know, the whole role of ambassadorship is it was new to me. Um, but having that background of of mentorship, teaching, uh, it felt like a a great transition into into growth. Um, as an ambassador, as a global brand ambassador, I travel around the world representing the House of Angostura um, to bar shows, doing uh, master classes, uh, whether it be interview seminars. Uh, guest shifts. So I traveled to different parts of the world. Um, uh, to this, uh, so when I won in 2013, my ambassadorship was only for one year. So you win uh, 10,000 US and you get an ambassadorship for one year. Um, at the end of the year, they offered me another contract. And it has been like that since then. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been with them since I think they like me. So I'm, I'm happy for that. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so I've had the the honor and uh, the privilege of, you know, visiting over a combination of um, 75 countries and cities globally, um, seeing different, uh, you know, cultures of drinking and embracing. And I mean, when I travel, I don't get to do the tourist thing. I go to bars, you know, it's, um, it's a different form of tourism, but I, uh, so I, I don't explore the, the popular tourist side. I go to the best bars in the world. I get to meet the best bartenders in the world. Um, so it's truly an honor for me to have this this opportunity, and not only that, but as a Caribbean bartender, someone who is not seen in the in that realm of of that caliber of cocktail making, or coming from a, an island that is still a novice island when it comes to cocktail making, uh, I, I feel very honored for that. So. Uh, what do you think you've taught people about Angostura that they might not have known? Ah, uh, um, so my, I love that I get to represent the House of Angostura. I, I grew up in Angostura. You know, it's it's one of those, um, everyone respects Angostura bitters. You know, you, as a bartender, when you start learning about uh, classic cocktails, learning how to make cocktails, you learn about the classic cocktails. It's like a chef. You have to learn the, the, the classics first, the traditional stuff. And Angostura bitters is a part of that. I mean, the very definition of a cocktail was defined by Dr. Jerry Thomas as any drink that contains a spirit, water, sugar, and bitters. Now, you know, there's this huge debate about which bitters uh, was, uh, you know, the predecessor to, or precursor into cocktails. And I have to say that um, in my experience, I can confidently say that Angostura has, we've been the pioneers into that realm of moving the elixirs that the monks made in monasteries into the cocktail world. You had abbots, uh, you had abbots, I think, available in, uh, 1841 to 51, you had Sonats, the UK bitters. Jerry Thomas had his own signature style. You had Sonats, sorry, I said Sonats. You had Abbots, Bokers. But Angostura was available in 1824. The recipe was perfected in the year 1824. And that is where it uh, really took that place and position into cocktails. So I'm very honored to represent a brand that has been a part of the very foundation of the cocktail industry. And we continue to be a part of that evolution, uh, where to this day, every great bartender uh, would have Angostura aromatic bitters in their bar, or if they compete in competitions, even though you have multiple 
selections of bitters out there, they would use the specialty bitters, but they would still use the aromatic bitters from the House of Angostura to bring that balance and integrate everything together. So when I see the respect and appreciation for Angostura globally, I feel honored by that. And um, I, I think what I bring that's uh, unique is the fact that I grew up with it. I feel like it's in my DNA. Uh, you know, as a kid, I told you we, you know, it's in the it's in the cupboard. You, every kitchen, every every house in the Caribbean has a bottle of Angostura bitters. I mean, you go to the supermarket, you get rice, sugar, milk, and Angostura bitters. I can tell you that. Like it's, it's on a, on a Sunday, it's like the the ice cream day. It's a it's a family day where you go out and you go and you get ice cream and you get coconut ice cream or like a like a local uh, fruit flavored ice cream, and we go back home. And you have your bowl of ice cream and Angostura bitters and you add a few dashes while you're eating. Uh, you know, and it's, it's been a part of our culture. Like for me growing up, I never thought about Angostura bitters being something for cocktails because it was always integrated in food. When my mom would make stews, when she would make uh, pastries, anything, Angostura bitters was always there. I could smell like there was something called sweet bread. It's like a, uh, it's a, it's a British thing uh, that you would have with your teas. Uh, and she'd make it, and I could always remember that smell of the Angostura bitters whenever she was making it. So that's where I bring that that unique vibe to anyone that I share, you know, a drink of Angostura, where do I, I have a masterclass with? Because I know what it is to see, you know, the sugarcane feels. Uh, you know, when people talk about sugarcane, and they talk about rum coming from sugarcane, I'm like, do you have you ever felt sugarcane in your hand? I, you know, I've I've been, I've, you know, during the dry season, my brothers and myself would go into the fields and we'd pick sugarcane with your hand. You break it with your feet and you peel it with your teeth. You know, it sounds a bit savage, but you bite into the sweet nectar of the sugarcane juice, and you know, you're just kids and you're enjoying this. And I always remember seeing the butterflies coming during the dry season uh, in the sugarcane fields, and. I understand now that the farmers knew when the sugarcane was at its ripest, whenever the butterflies would sit oh. on the sugarcane. And that's why for us, you know, in the house of Angostura, I know you will almost see this, but, at the, you know, on the bottle, we emboss oh. all of, uh, you know, there's that symbol of the butterfly everywhere. And um, I mean, if you put it on a bright light and you see a, butter, a magical butterfly appear, you've drank too much Angostura. But, uh, <laughs> 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 I love it. Everyone get their bottle and look at the bottom. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a butterfly there. Yeah. I would have never seen that. <laughs> so, you know, for, for the farmers, it was a sign from the gods. For us at the House of Angostura, we're very... It's very romantic. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's cultural. So we have the Angostura bitters, which everyone knows. You know, everyone knows and loves the Angostura bitters. And because I'm the global brand ambassador, I get to see the appreciation of Angostura bitters globally. Now, the anatomy of a cocktail starts with a base spirit. It could be rum, vodka, tequila, a base spirit. Then you have the option of a supplementary or secondary spirit, like a liqueur. Then you have what is called a modifier. Your modifiers, your juice, your nectars, your syrups, and then you have an accent. And the accent is the bitters. So one, two, three dashes accentuates your cocktail. And this is why you only add a few dashes. But I always remember the first time I went to Chicago, and it was like it was like a scene from a movie. I walked into the bar, and the bartender has two bottles of Angostura bitters. Now I grew up in Angostura bitters, adding dashes, right? Adding it on my ice cream, like I said, you know, in the ketchup with the chicken and fries. But I walk into this bar, and the bartender has two bottles pouring ten shots of Angostura bitters. I did he know you? Wait, did he know you were coming? Did he <laughs> no, know no, you were no, coming? No. <laughs> It was, it was, it was, honestly, it was one of those, those moments where it was just so surreal. So I walked into the bar. It was a small bar. So it was very scenic, like a scene from a movie. I walked down. The bar is right in front of you as you walk down. Aiko, come here. Aiko. Apologies. Aiko. Aiko. Apologies. What is that? Come here. Come here. Come here. No. Come here. 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 Sit. Apologies. My wife is expected to, to be home any minute now. So, but she's not going to come because she knows I'm doing the podcast. 
but he gets very he's very close to her so he gets all worked up so i'm, I'm, a, dog, I'm, yeah. I'm a dog lover so i know so i know yeah. all um, right so i'm just gonna go back right. to the story yeah start the story again yeah yeah so first time in chicago and like i said it's just very scenic i i walked down into this bar and it was like a scene from a movie the bartender has two bottles of angostura aromatic bitters pouring 10 shots of angostura bitters and I looked at him in amazement. I walked up to him and I, it was so surreal for me. I walked up to him, I said, I said, big man, whoever this is for, please pour a shot for me and I'm paying for it. It's on, it's on me. You know, I had no idea what was happening. <laughs> Are you sure he didn't know you were coming? <laughs> no, I, it was ah. like, I, I'll be honest with you. It's like, you know, he did not. You know, at that time, this was like my, you know, I had now, you know, I'm now into the rule of, uh, of the ambassadorship and, um, so, you know, I wasn't as, as, as known as I am today. And, um, but, you know, I had a shot of Angostura Bitters. And every bar I went to in Chicago, I had shots of Angle. There was a bar called Best Intentions. And yes, there's right. a sign, you know, I don't know if you know Best Intentions. And, of course, they have a sign outside, a neon sign, Angostura on draft for US dollar shots of Angostura Bitters. I, I remember cranking down the chill shots of Angostura Bitters you know, with my own hands, and I couldn't believe it. And even before they did that, I went to the bar and I met the brothers before. And I remember they saying, you know, one of them was saying, you know, could we get barrels of Angostura bitters? I said, well, you could get kegs, you know, but, you know, so they negotiated and they got their kegs and, um, and they did it. And even later on, I went uh, during summertime and I was in the outdoor terrace doing a guest ship there. And I always remember I'm setting up the bar and one of the brothers comes and he puts two. 750 ml bottles full with a speed pourer of angostura bitters on the bar for me he's like this is for the shots later i'm like oh man these guys oh are, chicago, these guys. Chicago, <laughs> chicago must be your favorite place of all time right <laughs> i love it i love it i mean it's it's just we don't advocate angostura aromatic bitters as a shot because you know according to the fda it's a food ingredient it's an accent so you add it by the dashes you go to new york city they don't do that there they take they think, you know, dashes of Angostura bitters, the bartenders in London, same thing. So Chicago has a unique vibe because of prohibition, I feel. And that mm -hmm. really created that, that whole sensation. You go to Peru, they meticulously pour three dashes on top of their Pisco Sours. Um, but in Malaysia, I remember going to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And um, I did a guest shift. My first guest shift was at a bar called Omakasi and Appreciate, a beautiful speakeasy bar. And within two hours, in two, this is a, a 100 ml bottle, but in two hours, we finished eight 200 ml bottles of Angostura bitters. I mean, the average person takes about, you know, a, if you're at home, this would last a long while. If you're in a bar that has great Angostura cocktails, you're going to go through a few. But in two hours, eight bottles, I stopped for a moment. I'm like, guys, I need to take a photo. And um, so they do something called the Malaysian, there's a hashtag, you can check it out. The Malay Malaysian bartender's handshake. It's a bartender's thing. And they take copious shots of Angostura bitters. But like I said, uh, if you go on my social platforms, you'd see everything is, is very Angostura related, but you will not see in my entire feed, you would not see a shot of Angostura bitters being promoted because like I said, legally, we don't promote it. But any bartender who knows me, they know we've had a good shot of Angus <laughs> bitters. Um, so it is a thing. Right. I will not deny it, but I will say that um, we do not, like, as a disclaimer again, we do not promote Angus bitters as a shot. Yeah, you have to go to Chicago. <laughs> you got to go to Chicago. Yeah. Right. Now, how about the rums? Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those scenarios where I feel so, so honored to represent a company that has such an iconic brand. I mean, Angus Aromatic Bitters is the most globally distributed cocktail ingredient in the world. So it has that respect for the craftsmanship. A bartender picks up a bottle, he or she doesn't think about if it's going to do the same thing. You know, it, they know, they have that confidence in Angostura. So we've been producing rums for over 160 years. Uh, we've been in that rum and rum making and blending for, for a long time. You know, the Seegers family who created the bitters in Venezuela, uh, when Dr. Johan Siegert passed away, you know, he created the bitters in a town in, in Venezuela called Angostura. I mean, this is this is some gangster stuff because, you know, they, I would call it more, you know, more entrepreneurialism, but they purchased the name of the town, and which is now called Ciudad Bolivar. 
and they took the name because of the brand. And, you know, I just want to say that if anyone is interested in doing brand study, Angus Turbid is a, is a great uh, subject to use because you're looking at protecting a brand name. They saw the potential and they, they purchased the name of the street, of the, the town took it to Trinidad and Tobago, which is closer, and you know the structure of the economy allowed them to be able to build their business better. Now, in addition to that, people always talk about the label and the oversized label. And the reason why I said it's a great study for anyone in marketing, one of the forms of marketing that they use, I remember, was competing in competitions around the world. Now, during that time, there were no frequent flyers. You know, there was, there was no planes to just jump on and, and in two hours you're here and there. They would take voyages that would took a, take a month or even two months to, to get across the ocean. And they would compete in competitions. So each of the three brothers who were invested in the business, uh, one was responsible for the bottling, one for the label, one for the content. And, of course, you don't have the mechanics of communication like you have today. So no emails, no WhatsApp, you know, no quick mobile calls. So, of course, when it's time for the competition and the deadline meets, they put everything together. The label is oversized. What do we do? You don't want, you already planned so much for this trip. You go ahead. They competed in the competition and they came last. You know, and this is where the, the moral of the story really comes together. They came last in the competition. But one of the judges at the end came to them and said, this is very unique and that they can use this to their advantage. And this is where the whole, you know, the whole term of, uh, you know, bad publicity, good publicity, you can still use it. And they took that iconic feature. And to this day, they have never changed that packaging. I mean, you see brands changing their packaging all the time, but we've never changed this iconic feature. So what was once a mystic is now an iconic feature. All right on the brand so that's something to take note of so the Seegers family they came and they partnered with the Fernandez family who had a company called Trinidad Distillers and Trinidad Distillers was one of the top rum producers in the Caribbean um, uh, so it's a very wealthy family and uh, they, they were heavily invested in rum they had um, a lot of you know advanced technology uh, that they were using and when they came together you know, they created the House of Angostura. And this is where the, the magic of, of Angostura was really birthed because the base spirit that is used in Angostura aromatic bitters is rum. Now, of course, it's been a secret for, for almost 200 years. Uh, I myself, I don't know the secret, so uh, no thoughts of kidnapping me uh, will be needed. <laughs> but only five people today know the secret for the recipe. And um, we don't put them in the same room or same flight or same restaurant. Um, but one of the unique features of this, whenever you get to visit the House of Angostura, there is a room called the secret room. Now, there's a label on the door that says secret room. So it's not much of a secret, but it is a secret because only one of the five people can enter. The dry ingredients come from all over the world. We've never changed the recipe to date. So it's very it's a simple recipe, but we don't know it. But it's simple because we've never changed the, the recipe, which means that the processing is the same. The methodology is the same. Mm -hmm. um, all the dry ingredients comes from different parts of the world, goes to London, comes to Trinidad, and the government assists in ensuring that the secrecy is maintained by allowing it to just go straight to Angostura without any questions. Uh, so it's, it's a whole, it's, you know, it takes a village <laughs> to maintain this secret. Huh? <laughs> More like a nation to maintain this secret. It takes an island, secret. right. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to Trinidad, it goes into the secret room. And at the secret room, only one of the five people, they go inside there, they weigh the ingredients, they grind it, and it's sifted because the process of making uh, bitters is a maceration process. They steep the liquid in, 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 uh, in, in um, the percolator. But one of the unique factors is that we use cold percolation. Now, cold percolation is similar to like cold press or cold brew coffee. You know, so you don't get, with hot percolation, you get uh, very astringent or volatile oils coming out. But cold percolation, it's tempered a bit. And that's where we get, you know, beautiful oils coming out with no volatile astringency. Um, so, yeah, so then we add a homemade caramel and leave it in the vats for three months. It's not an age process. It's just a maceration. So this craftsmanship uh, and, you know, the trust that bartenders and, you know, the trade and people around the world have in Angostura bitters goes into our rums. A lot of people don't know that 
to this day, we have the largest range of award-winning rums. And I mean, that could be a cliched statement for many brands. But in addition to that, we also have the most expensive rum in the world, Legacy by Angostura. Uh, only 20 bottles. This was created in 2012, and only 20 bottles were made. Um, it was a blend of uh, seven of um, rums uh, having the youngest age of 17 years. And the blend was really a craftsmanship or an opportunity for the master distiller to showcase his craftsmanship. The bottle was done by Asprey in London. And the, there was a nice silver platinum finish to the top with the, the butterfly and the sugar cane. And uh, it, was, it was gorgeous. Um, all the proceeds, however, for the sales of those 20 bottles that were auctioned went to charity. So this was really an opportunity. It was a marketing project, but it was also an opportunity for the master distiller to showcase his passion. And that's, you said, you know, you asked earlier, what am I bringing to the table? And that's just it, the passion, the, 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 the love of the island, the love of Angostura, that, that passion that we put into what we produce. You know, on the island, we're very happy people. I don't know if it's just the sun, but, you know, we're, you know, I love to smile. I mean, I always feel like you still have a drink without smiling. I, I don't want that. I, I, you know, I don't want that bad energy. Give me, it's all about the vibration, you know, and a smile does so much. And, um, and that energy goes into the craftsmanship of the rums. And uh, I get to represent that. And I get to be an example of that. Um, and my love for hospitality and my confidence in representing a brand with such good integrity is something that allows me to, to really excel in my job. You know, when you're just saying when you have the right tools, you can really perform. And, and this is true to the fact of my ambassadorship. So, you know, I mean, I've, I've been given, you know, many different honors uh, in terms of what I do. But I think it's a combination of all these factors, having a good brand to work with, in addition to my love for hospitality. I can tell. Yeah. I can tell. <laughs> well, I can't wait to have, mm. you, you know, to taste some of the Sangastora rum with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. All right. my pleasure. And, <laughs> and even, I might do a shot, but oh. even though, you know, <laughs> don't listen, tell anyone. Listen, let me, let me tell you something about a shot, right? It is not a bad thing. I want you to understand this, okay? So I'm going to give you some, some personal, this is personal reflections of having this shot. Now, because Angostura Bitters was created as medicine, I want you to understand that it's an alkalizer. Now, people use it as a hangover remedy, and they add a few dashes into their stelza water and sparkling water, but that's not enough. Uh, take it from me. There's, there's a story, there was a story, um, a, a myth, and let me debunk that myth right now, that having uh, too much Angostura Bitters is fatal. And I want to say that I am living testimonial that... <laughs> You know, that that is not true. Um, because it's a, it's an alkalizer, when you when you when you drink alcohol, you create an acidic environment in your stomach. And when it's too acidic, when you know, there's too much acidity, that's when you start to puke or vomit. So you take Angostura bitters. But my advice is you take nothing less than 15 ml. So if you want to do like me, my nightcap, when I so my job as a brand ambassador, I go to a bar show. I get up early in the morning, I go to the bar show, I'm tasting, I'm tasting. You come to the booth, we say, hi, I taste. And then from tasting, I go to, I do a master class uh, or maybe two master classes or three and at the bar shows. And then from there, you go to a guest shift. Same day, all right? So there's no stopping, all right? There's no, you go to the guest shift, you're mixing cocktails for two, three hours, taking shots, taking drinks. So you just, you've been drinking all day, right? After that, you do a bar visit. So you go visiting bars. So you visit about five bars throughout the night, straight until like two, four in the morning. So you're still drinking. And um, so it's one of those scenarios where it, there's a toss-up. You know, someone could say, oh, you don't have to say yes to, to every shot. And it's true. No one, you know, I've been able to maintain a reputation. You don't see me staggering, you know, hey, I, I'm – House of as a brand ambassador. Like there's there's not gonna be a reflection of that. And I want to maintain that level of professionalism. Um mm -hmm. and in doing so I have to make sure I eat right, I drink enough, I hydrate enough, you know. So I'm always very health conscious. So I, I get up in the morning, early I go, I run, get two liters of water in my body, so that way I can consume enough alcohol and you know, I, I eat right, stuff like that. But at the end of the night, I take 
or 30 ml full size shot, you know, Jaeger size, tequila size shot of Angostura bitters. And in the morning you get up and you're like, oh, I did nothing last night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's why everyone is so happy and kind in Chicago. It's that's a great probably, city. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's that's the true. Okay. You're right. So yeah. that is that is a great lesson to end on for anyone who wants to be a brand ambassador. All right. Just know that is your life. You're going to end every night with some Angostura. <laughs> well, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure, so I, I thank you so much for being on the show. And um, I'll see you in Paris. Yeah. Let me know whenever right. you're coming up. It'll be a pleasure to have a drink of Angostura with you. There's Paris, there's BCB, I think, still happening. But let me know where you're at. I know we're still a little bit conscious of, uh, of where we travel. But if ever you're in Paris, it will be a delight. Of course, I couldn't let him go without knowing his top tips for the home bartender and where he would drink right now if he had the choice. Um, so tip number one, invest in good tools. You know, I always feel like as a bartender, we, we see bartenders out there and we think, well, it's easy. I could do that. If you have the right tools, it will be easy. Uh, so even if you're not, uh, today is different. I mean, I could, I could go learn to do anything on YouTube right now. So there are a few good videos that can really guide you. Invest in a few good tools. And like there are five main tools, I would say. Get a cobbler shaker, which is a three-piece shaker. That's the easiest shaker to, for a home bartender. Um, you get a strainer, which is a Horton strainer. Um, sorry, a julep strainer. Um, if you're getting the cobbler shaker, julep strainer, a mixing glass. The julep strainer is for the mixing glass. So you can stir your cocktail and strain it. Um, and then um, I would say a mixing spoon, a good spoon to mix to stir the cocktails. Uh, and a muddler. A muddler will be a nice option if you want to have, uh, if you want to do some nice classic mojitos. So having those tools makes you feel like you can really deliver the job. Now, yes, of course, we all been through a lockdown phase, so we know how to, to use. Uh, we've been back to the basics using mason jars and stuff like that. But I can guarantee you the quality of your daiquiri will never be the same when you have the right tools. The next um, on the list I would say would be invest in good quality spirits. If you're a home bartender, People have this. Uh, people who are not into cocktails, they think that a cocktail is like a sangria. You know, the birth of sangria started with bad wine, and you throw a bunch of fruits in there to preserve it. But no, uh, sangria is good. I love good sangrias, but a cocktail requires good quality spirits. If you want a good cocktail, you need a good quality spirit. And a great example of that is a classic dry martini. You can test a bartender by asking for a classic dry martini. You know, of course, you know, if a bartender suggests vodka, it's optional. Vodka is a thing today, but uh, if you want a classic, you have to go with a gin. And then the quality of the gin, the type of gin you choose is a factor. The type of vermouth you choose is a factor. The type of ice you use is a factor. So you want to make sure that you have good quality spirits. Uh, so invest in the basics like rum, vodka, tequila, and vermouth. And I, once you have those, you can you can experiment with other stuff. You know, if you come to a seminar of Angostura with myself, I can show you what type of rums to get. But um, those are some main spirits to get: rum, vodka, tequila. And you don't have to go flavored stuff. You can just get the plain stuff. You know, and then eventually advance from there. The next term um, on the list, the third item I would say would be ice. Your quality of your ice makes a big difference. Imagine you're spending all this money on good spirits and then you throw wet bad ice into your cocktail or ice that's tasting like chlorine like it's it's going to ruin that spirit it's going to ruin the, your the ice makes up for 20 percent of the cocktail so you want to ensure that the quality of the ice is good mineral or distilled water so my advice would be have a selection so i love to do ice in my fridge if you're home get a, a silicone pan Right, a baking pan, anything. You don't go buy anything. It's already there. If you bake bread, if you have a plastic Tupperware, you can use that. But get spring water, distilled water, and you pour it in, and you put it in the fridge. And that's it. The taste of the ice, cover it. Now, when the ice is frozen, you get your bread knife or serrated knife. You carve a little edge, tap it. You cut some nice blocks, and you put it in Ziploc bags and put it back in the freezer. And whenever you pull out your bad boy, 
get a good glass, you drop one of those nice blocks inside there, and you can sip premium spirits with that ice. Or you can make great cocktails with that ice. So those are three, um, three main factors for the home bartender. Um, the no, that's great. Part, that's, yeah. Oh, you have I'm four. Gonna, I'm going to say one more. All right. One more that's going to take you to that edge. If, so if you're a home bartender who wants to be the advanced bartender, who wants to be the, 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 the highlight of the party, all right, who wants to make everyone feel sexy at the end of the night, this is what you need to do. You need to be able to, to, to use fresh ingredients, fresh lime juice, uh, fresh citrus. If you can make it fresh citrus, it's going to be delicious. And also, once you have exploring with fruits, if you can garnish now remember, it's all about how it looks. At the end of the day, it's 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 how it looks, all right? Guys and girls, we know this. It's about how it looks. So when you when you can garnish a drink, all right, because we 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 are attracted to the drink by the way it looks before we even taste. And this is why Instagram is such a big thing when it comes to cocktails and food. Uh, so make sure that you know how to do a few garnishes, like twisting a peel. You don't have to do a big salad on a drink, no. You can just know how to twist the peel and make it look good. And I think you're going to be the star of the party. I can't wait to get started again. <laughs> right, I'm ready to make those drinks. <laughs> okay. Last but not least, mm -hmm. if you could be anywhere right now having mm -hmm. a cocktail, where would that be? Oh, three places. Very easy. Uh, due to the fact that I have not been home in a while i need to go to trinidad and tobago and drink 1919 angostura 1919 rum and coconut water fresh coconut water that's it that's all i need i mean you have no idea how such a simple serve is so delicious we love fresh coconut water with rum and it's it's a delight mm -hmm. so that's one um, the other would be to peru um, the drinking culture in Peru is, I love the way they, the Pisco Sour is such, they, they have such a passion and, um, and reverence for their Pisco Sour. I mean, you go into any bar and you see jars of infusions of uh, Pisco, like you have uh, pineapple, ginger, uh, coca leaves, and everything is just, you know, um, for their Pisco Sours. So I love that culture. And the third would be, South Italy. I love the Italian drinking style. And um, I think, you know, I, I, I just, I love having coffee the Italian way. I mean, I live in Paris right now, but I, you know, I, I love the Italian way of drinking coffee and aperitivo. Uh, in the US, low ABV is a big thing. Um, but I always felt like even before low ABV became a, you know, became a trend, I felt like the Italians were doing that with aperitivo style drinks and aperitivo bitters. And, and um, so I love, I remember the first time I drank in Milano with some bartenders, you know, it's like four in the morning. I'm like, guys, you know, I'm, I'm, I, we, I didn't feel like I, I, I'm a rum guy, you know? So, <laughs> and it's because we've been drinking low ABV or aperitivo mm -hmm. style drinks um, all night. So it was, uh, it was something very interesting and I just love. So for me, um, I'm in Paris and I, whenever I have a meal, I normally do uh, wine, but if I don't, sometimes I feel for a nice aperitivo style drink. Um, I mean, right now I'm having what is called a Trinidad Torino, which is a mix of sweet vermouth with an Amaro. And I'm using our, uh, the House of Angostura, our Amaro, Amaro de Angostura. So equal parts, 45 ml of Amaro de Angostura, 45 ml of a sweet vermouth, one dash of Angostura bitters, and that's it. <laughs> Fabulous. I can't wait to try that too. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. It was so amazing to have Daniel on the show today, and I can't wait to drink with him anywhere he chooses. He leaves us with one of his signature cocktails with a great name as the Cocktail of the Week. Our Cocktail of the Week is called the Amore Amaro which in Italian means bitter love, blending Amaro de Angostura with Angostura bitters. Very clever and simply delicious. Add all of the following ingredients to a shaker. One and a half ounces of Amaro de Angostura, a quarter ounce Angostura aromatic bitters, three quarters of an ounce fresh pressed lime juice, and three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. Add ice and shake, shake, shake. 
Then double strain into a coupe glass. And then express a lime peel over the cocktail, then garnish it with that peel. And as Daniel says, always serve it with a smile. You'll find this recipe plus all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com where you'll find links to all the ingredients. I'm an ice cream lover, but I hate coconut. So I asked Daniel for another way to enjoy bitters with ice cream. He told me it works like magic with pralines and cream. So I bought some, dashed in a few bitters, and added a touch of bourbon as well. And oh my God. If you live for Lush Life, make sure you're giving back to the bars you love by donating or taking part in cocktail delivery where you live or visit one now that they're open. The music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly and wash your hands and stay safe. Next time, we have our last episode before we take a short summer break. We'll be compiling all the top tips for the home bartender that our lovely Lush Life guests have given us into one fabulous episode. Until that time, bottoms up.